Shabbat Shalom. We're back. Hallelujah. Baruch Hashem Yahweh. Excited to be back after Sukkot in a new season as we come into this section. We're looking at Ephesians. I'm not actually going to get into much today because I want to do an introduction, as I've done in times past with other books, into the book. Um, that comes from years of me sitting in assemblies and pastors going into Bible teaching after Bible teaching and giving me no background or idea of the true context of what was happening. We want it to relate to today. Of course we do. We want the scriptures to relate to today. The scriptures do relate to today. But we can't forget the context, the history behind what we're reading so that when we do relate it and see it to, to, in our lives today, it is powerfully impacting because it is not divorced from the context. So for me, a big part of integrity of teaching the scripture is to spend the time giving us an introduction. So today, like I say, I'm not going to get into too much. I don't have too much for you, but I hope that it will inspire us in our own study time to have that framework as as we go in to the book, we'll always have the remembrance of the history and the context of the scripture, which actually will enable us to unlock prophecy and true revelation, true revelation that is within the context of walking it out today. So let's turn, if you want, to your scriptures, to Ephesians chapter 1, and I'll, I'll give you an intro, and um, we'll go from there. So the focus, as you look into this book of Ephesians, is the great mystery of the assembly, the people. That is powerful because when I'm talking and communicating to everybody today, it's people, isn't it? And the majority of the people that I'm communicating with are trying to ascertain what is it exactly that it's supposed to look like as an assembly in my family. I mean, do we keep the Shabbat? What are we supposed to do when the, with the biblical feasts? I mean, how do we live? How do we eat? How do we dress? How do we live in the assembly life? So is the book of Ephesians going to give us insight to that for sure and for certain? Because this book focuses on that mystery and... It is a mystery. It's more of a mystery to some than it is to others, right? A lot more of a mystery to some when you start speaking to them about the Sabbath and biblical feasts and festivals. That is an absolute mystery to those that haven't heard it. So as we dig into this, we're going to see how does this assembly, the body of believers that know Yahusha, how do we function in relation to the Torah? In light of the redemptive work of Yahusha, how on earth do we celebrate in light of the influx of those that are coming in from the nations? The Ephesians community was dealing with an influx coming from the pagan nations. And we ourselves today, do we deal with an influx of people coming from a religious background that is stooped with paganism? Because 21st century Christianity has its roots in pagan worship. So yes, we're dealing contextually even with some of the very same struggles. Trying to lay down those familiar idols. Trying to lay down those um, holidays and pick up Yahweh's biblical holy days. That's very difficult for some. Yes, we're not dealing with the worshippers of Diana, but we are dealing with the winter solstice and all kinds of pagan things in our day and age. So we're going to see some of those very, very similar struggles in the community then as we deal with our community now. The issues they are very relevant to us today. They really are very relevant today. So Ephesians, the emphasis that we're going to see is the assembly, the community where the believers come together is the place where Yahweh's power is manifest. 
And ultimately, Yahuwah manifests his power because he wants to reconcile humanity together. First, he wants to reconcile man to himself. Then he wants to reconcile husband and wife. Then he wants to reconcile father with children, mothers with daughters. He's looking to reconcile the family unit. So then we can go out to the nations, mothers and fathers, in-laws, the whole shebang. That is about Yahuwah's power manifest within the assembly. And we see it today. We're just coming off a tour to the tribes. I think, in my opinion, the best Sukkot that I've ever had. Because it was about reconciling people and relationships to see people singing and praying and worshiping together and having that community to me was more powerful than all the doctrine and dogma that could ever be spewed from the pulpit to see changes in humanity changes in community changes in relationship and that's what we're going to see a, a shift in Paul's maturity level in the way that he communicates in this letter to the Ephesians. Because ultimately you're going to see that the option of taking your ball and playing it in another playing field because you didn't get along with somebody, it's not a biblical option. You've got to wrestle in the mire and the clay so that you can get the true community and healing that the word requires for us, that Yahusha has manifest himself to us so that we can do that. So without further ado, we're going to have Stephanie come up and read the text for us of Ephesians chapter 1. Like I said, today is an introduction, but I do want to get some Bible text in us because there is nothing sharper than the two-edged sword of the word. So thank you, Stephanie. Ephesians 1, Shaul, an emissary of Yahushua Messiah by the desire of Elohim, to the set-apart ones who are in Ephesus and true to Messiah Yahushua, favor to you and peace from Elohim our Father and the Master Yahushua Messiah. Blessed be the Elohim and Father of our Master Yahushua Messiah, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Messiah even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be set apart and blameless before him in love, having previously ordained us to adoption as sons through Yahushua Messiah to himself, according to the good pleasure of his desire, to the praise of the esteem of his favor, with which he favored us in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of trespasses according to the riches, riches of his favor, which he has lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, having made known to us the secret of his desire according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in him, to administer at the completion of time, to gather together in one all in Messiah, both which are in the heavens and which are on the earth in him in whom also we did obtain an inheritance being previously ordained according to the purpose of him, working all matters according to the counsel of his desire for us to be the praise of his esteem, those having first trusted in Messiah, in whom you also, having heard the word of the truth, the good news of your deliverance, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with a set-apart spirit of promise." who is the pledge of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his esteem. For this reason, I too, having heard of your belief in the Master Yahusha and your love for all the set-apart ones, do not cease giving thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the Elohim of our Master Yahusha Messiah, the Father of esteem, would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you know what is the expectation of his calling and what are the riches of the esteem of his inheritance in the set-apart ones. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who are believing according to the working of his mighty strength, which he wrought in the Messiah when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies? 
far above all rule and authority and power and mastery and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all under his feet and gave him to be head over all to the assembly, which is his body, the completeness of him who fills all in all. Amen. Oh, I just love to listen to the the word. I could listen all day, all day, all day. Thank you, Stephanie. Powerful. There's so much there, isn't there? So much there. And just to, to hear that, the word go out as we go and anticipate this venture into the scriptures, Ephesians chapter 1. Today, though, we're going to look at the intro um, to set us up for these great things to come. Right out of the gate, look, Shaul, a shaliach, an apostle of Yahusha Hamashiach. So right out the gate, to me, it's, it's apparent that Paul's suffering from the stigma of being a murderer. I mean, think about it. I mean, he persecuted the early assembly. He's most probably renowned within the dispersion as, oh yeah, yeah, here comes Paul the murderer. So he's setting us up right from the beginning. No, I'm, I'm Paul the apostle. I know that formally my conduct, my conduct was, but I'm Paul the Apostle. I've been forgiven, and now I've been sent out a shaliach for a specific, specific purpose. Because um, his name and his reputation within the early believing community is he was Paul the murderer. He was Paul the persecutor, and he wasn't trusted. So he sets himself up as the deliverer, the shaliach, the one that is sent out for a specific purpose. I think that's why that is in the very first verse of this this letter because um, even today you find that I find and I think maybe you'd agree with me that's something that that um, we we struggle with within our assemblies not necessarily here but as believers um, that we don't restore those that have repented quick enough we don't we don't restore those that have fully repented of sin quick enough. And the other end of that is that we don't condemn and discipline those that remain in sin quick enough. And here we can see a man that has been restored. And though Paul had failed, though he had sinned, yeah, he imprisoned. Yes, he even murdered the faithful. Yahusha chose to restore him. Yahusha chose to restore him and entrust him with a great, great task of being that sholiach, that sent out one. Sent out for a specific purpose. Don't let the sins of your past stop you from being used mightily by Yahuwah in the present and in the future. Because your mind is to be transformed. If I continue to look back, I would never be able to stand and, and go forward. Because we can see right here, restoration. We serve an Elohim of restoration. But also, we have a responsibility to call out and discipline those that haven't repented. That those that do remain in sin. We have a responsibility to do that. It's very important that we have our eyes wide open in these days. That we restore quickly and that we condemn and discipline just as quickly. Because we need to keep a clean house, a clean camp, so that we can continue to go on forward. So as we go through these first opening, opening studies, again, I want to bring our attention to the Greek word kurios, kurios Yahweh. We can see in the first few verses here that we can find grace be to you and peace from Elohim our Father and from the yod Hey wah Hey. 
Yahusha Messiah. If it was translated that way, you would really stop and pause, would you not? And it should be translated that way because the Greek word that's used here is the Greek word kurios, Yahuwah, and of course the Torot, the Torot of first mention for the Greek word kurios is Genesis chapter 15 verse 8. And in context that is the coming of the kurios or the Adonai Yahuwah at that very Malkitzedic covenant of the pieces. So we can see that kurios, that Greek word translated in the Septuagint, emphasizes here Yahusha as the fulfiller of the covenant. He's the one that fulfilled the death penalty, bringing salvation and deliverance to the righteous whilst bringing judgment on the oppressors. And now this message is going out to the dispersion. So the emphasis of this letter is that it's been sent out to communicate to believers that are part of the commonwealth of Israel. So I see here that Paul has actually matured in the way that he communicates within this letter because there is a lot more shalom and a lot more spirit. A lot more shalom and a lot more spirit in the book of Ephesians. What do I mean? He's gone. If you really pay attention to his previous letters, his previous writings, he's gone from one of doctrine and reasoned argument into more of doxology and prayer. And I think about that for myself because I used to be one that would sit around and I don't know how reasonable I was, but I would argue over doctrine. But I am so not there anymore. I have a lot more spirit, a lot more shalom, and I've just come off of a Sioux coat where there's been a lot more doxology. Doxology, to those that you may not be familiar with that term, is one where you are singing scriptural themes together and praying, of course, praying together. Paul moves in the letter to the Ephesians from one of argument and doctrine into doxology and, and prayer. And that is spirit and that is shalom. And that's maturity. No longer do I feel that I have to try and persuade somebody of the doctrine that I teach. And I believe as a community, we witness that at Sukkot. By the doxology, the singing, the songs, and the prayers, people witnessed by the Spirit to themselves what was truth. No longer is there the contention, and that to me is a mark of maturity. That's a mark of us growing and having an assuredness that what we teach is true. I don't have to prove it because I know it by the testimony of the Spirit. And I am convinced that the Spirit within you will recognize the Spirit within me. And that is the confirmation witness, not my arguments anymore. And I have been delivered from that. And I see that Paul has been delivered from that too. And that's the mark of maturity that happens the more that we're in the Scripture and the more that we see one another coming forth. And that, to me, is something that I have grown in the, in the Messianic and Hebrew Roots movement. Uh, a lot of argument, a lot of doctrine. I can't tell you how many debates I've turned down in the past year. Whereas if you'd have asked me 10 years ago, I was all about winning a debate but literally that is a spirit of contention that is no longer in me I am so thankful and I see that and I recognize that in Paul and I really do appreciate that now let's look at the words in the Greek the title of this book en Ephesios or at Ephesus they're actually absent from some of the oldest textual witnesses as well as manuscripts that were mentioned by Basil and the text used by Origen, there was no 
at Ephesus within the oldest manuscripts. So um, if we look at the text of a few passages, I think it will become pretty obvious to you, as it is obvious to me, that Paul didn't actually know his readers personally. He didn't know them. Chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore, ever since I heard of your trust in the Master Yahushua and of your love for all the Kedoshim, the saints. So he's heard, but he hasn't actually met you. Chapter 3, verse 2. Surely you have heard about the plan of Elohim's grace given to me for you. There's a, a sense of detachment there. Do you see that? Look at chapter 4, verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and were taught in him as the truth is in Yahushua. So to me, these verses show and establish a somewhat detached relationship between Paul and his audience. And notice what I said before I got into those few verses, that en Ephesus or in at Ephesus is actually absent from the oldest, oldest manuscripts. Meaning, I think it was a circular. There was a blank spot where the letter was be sent all over Asia and wherever it was being read, they would put in the name of that city. It was a circular letter that was going around the dispersion. Because the oldest manuscript it had does not have at Ephesus in it. So that to me tells that this letter was in fact intended for various assemblies throughout Asia Minor. In fact, in chapter 6 verse 21, we'll find that Tychius was in fact the courier. He was the postman that delivered this letter. And Ephesus could very well have been the point of its origin, yes. And from there, it would have been distributed as a circular around various cities and communities throughout Asia Minor. Paul, in fact, most probably sent the letter with Tychius when he sent Colossians. And the letter was copied and then circulated from Ephesus. And as a circular, it would make sense that they'd leave it blank. And then put in the name of the city that it was going to, the name and destination of the assembly at Laodicea, at Ephesus could then be inserted and it was read to the community because we're already establishing that it looks to me that he didn't have that intimate relationship of knowing the people. There was a detachment there. So this is all very important as we're going to go into the text later on. And in fact, you can see, I think, if you go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 15, you can see that this kind of circular letter, circular letter writing went on in Colossians. Colossians 4, 15, greet the brothers and sisters in Laodicea, as well as in Nympha and the community that meets in her house. When this letter has been read among you, make sure that it is also read in Messiah's community in Laodicea. In turn, you should read my letter coming from Laodicea. So it could actually be the text Ephesus that was written to the Laodiceans. And in turn, you should read my letter coming from blank. Right? Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. But I hope it makes sense to you. But then again, I've been like obsessing over this for weeks. So, <laughs> But uh, all that to say, I think it's a circular. Now, again, as we get into this, you can see that Colossians and Ephesians are strikingly similar. In fact, 34% of Colossians is paralleled some way with Ephesians. Sometimes you, you can be like, which book am I in? And 26, over 26% of Ephesians is actually paralleled in some way by Colossians. And Colossians came first, by the way. Colossians came first. 
So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what language was it written in? Japanese? I mean, Hebrew? Aramaic? Greek? Well, I know when I was in the Messianic movement, everything, that means everything is everything, had to have some kind of Hebrew or Aramaic primacy, right? No. Colossians was written in Greek. But, again, that's me maturing and not arguing. <laughs> Because no, I mean no, none, none whatsoever. There is no reputable scholar out there that has ever suggested a Hebrew or Aramaic origin of the epistle of Ephesians. It's only some elements of the Messianic movement, myself included, back in the day, that did succumb to a Hebrew or Aramaic primacy. But in all honesty, when you weigh it, no. So then the other question you have to ask yourself is, did Paul even write Ephesians? These are questions that are abounding all around as you start to dig in deeper. Now, not everyone agrees that Paul even wrote the letter. In fact, Ephesians is part of a collection of what are called the Deutero-Pauline letters, which includes Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and Titus. These are all texts where Paul's authorship has been disputed at one point or another. Even though I don't agree with that, I can understand why some would hold that view of Ephesians. Because if Paul was in prison, which we know that he was, right? And we know that Tychius was his courier then it's not improbable to me that Tychius could have acted as some kind of like secretary that actually helped Paul compose the letter, an administrator, somebody that he dictated to, somebody that helped him, his secretary. And then this, to me, would account for the stylistic and vocabulary differences that some people get just way too bogged down into. I think that you can easily see that Tychius was his secretary, and then that, to me, totally accounts for the stylistic and vocabulary differences that are apparent, but I don't think it's something that I'm going to get so hung up on and then deny that Paul wrote the letter. But people do. They do. And, you know, I wanted to, I want to bring these things forth to you because when I teach the scripture, I believe as you put it all out there, we're mature. And you need to know that there are these thoughts out there within the scholastic community or whatever you want to call it. But in reality, I think that you can explain that quite easily away that he was locked up for crying out loud and he most probably had a secretary of which he would dictate the letters to the communicar that would get then taken outside again. Tychius acted like a secretary and that to me makes a lot of sense. Now, history tells us, as we go on a little further, that the early church, that they had no problem accepting Pauline authorship of the book of Ephesians. It was accepted into the apostolic canon. The letter was known to Clement of Rome that it was written by Paul, and even Irenaeus accepted that it was of Pauline authorship. In fact, even the heretic Marcion, he acknowledged genuine Pauline authorship. And Marcion Marcion even accepted that. Now, people don't realize it today, but Marcion theology is in fact what today's evangelical Christianity has adopted. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if somehow Marcion ended up on the NIV um, board of directors. We know that's impossible, but by the translation, it's very Marcion inspired, if you will. Again, people don't realize that, but Marcion actually translated over 10 of Paul's letters to a lawless theology that has been picked up by evangelical Christianity, and they're actually asserting a doctrine that was actual heresy in the first century. So again, you've got to know the history so you don't make the mistakes of the past. Unfortunately, the NIV and a lot within the evangelical community have adopted 
this Marcionic theology. So, continuing, continuing on a little further, we can look at this consistent testimony of Pauline authorship and the phraseology of Ephesians that appears also in Colossians. And I find that the Pauline disbelievers with authorship, that their actual case becomes quite baseless and weak and unreliable when you look at the fact that Tychius was the courier and most probably was the secretary, which accounts for the stylistic and linguistic differences. Anyway, that's, you know, it's a lot to put forth, but I think you need to know that as we're going into the text. I sure would have appreciated somebody spending this time with me 20 years ago without buzzing through chapter one, because this is important stuff. Let's look at the location. Where was Paul when he wrote Ephesians? That's important. It could be part of what's called the prison epistles. Um, Philippians was part of the prison epistles. Colossians and again Philemon. These were all part of the prison epistles. Look at chapter 3 verse 1. For this reason, for this reason I, Paul, am a prisoner of Messiah Yahushua for the sake of you nations. Right? He could be banged up, couldn't he? Appears like that to me. Under house arrest for a couple of years. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, a prisoner of the master. He's definitely looking like he's locked up. Chapter 6, verse 20. I am an ambassador in chains. So I'm saying he's locked up. Two years, house arrest. We know that this happened. This, I think, is part of the prison epistles. So when was it written? Between 60 and 62 of the Common Era. Between 60 and 62 of the Common Era. Not many arguments on that. Don't really need to get in much depth to that. Now, let's talk about Ephesus, the city of Ephesus, because this is a huge context to what we're getting into. It was a leading city within the Roman Empire. In fact, it was the richest region within the Roman Empire. It was a major political and religious center of Asia Minor. It was a major seaport. It had a trading area. It had a, an amphitheater that could hold up to 24,000 people. That's huge. So it was very important in trading. It was a huge, huge area when it came to the provinces of, of Rome. It originally had been a Greek city, but it was taken by the Persians in 546 before the Common Era, only later to be libera liberated by Alexander the Great in 334 before the Common Era, and then later it fell under the wing of the Seleucia dynasty, which in turn fell to the Romans in about 130, 133 before the Common Era. Common era. At this point, it was totally under Roman control. And pagan worship was prevalent, prevalent, especially the veneration of Diana or Artemis. Now, as we get into this letter, you're going to see that repeatedly, Paul, he's contrasting the believer in Yahusha with the believer in Diana, because it was abounding all around him throughout the whole city. And the believers in Diana, what would they do? Well, they would offer up their bodies for sex in the temple with prostitutes. So he contrasts that with believers in Messiah who offer up their bodies as a living sacrifice unto Yahuwah. So we can miss the point, but that was huge. That was huge and very impactful when he communicated in that way. You are to offer your bodies up as a living sacrifice. That totally was politically incorrect. It was extremely offensive. Extremely offensive, that kind of language. And we can miss it if you don't understand just how ingrained the worship of Diana, in fact, was. Because the temple of the goddess Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. 
One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And no, I'm not going to get into the murder of Princess Diana under the bridge in, in France, but I could. Because it's connected. Well, we could find a connection, but we won't. But in one inscription, the city describes itself as the nurturer of the goddess. So the Ephesian city describes itself as the nurturer of the goddess, which makes Ephesus in turn, what? The most glorious of the cities. The most glorious of all of the Asian cities because Ephesus nurtured the goddess herself. So we can understand then why Paul uses words describing Yahusha as the nourisher of the body, his own body, the assembly, and the assembly as the glorious bride. You see what he's doing? He's contrasting familiar language that was attributed to the false goddess Diana, and now he's contrasting that with Yahusha. This is, this is crazy land speech. Powerful. You could have a riot just by communicate, and we miss it. Be like you going down into the local courtroom and saying, you know, Nazi. Or something like that, right? Ah! Politically incorrect. When we start talking about what we do as believers, which is holy and acceptable, it is absolutely outrageous to a pagan world, is it not? And so he's contrasting that. In fact, remember the riot at Ephesus? Let's just turn there just for the sake of this part of the text. Acts chapter 19, verse 21. The riot at Ephesus. There was riots. Acts 19, verse 21. Now, after these things were accomplished, Paul resolved in the Ruach to go to Jerusalem after passing through Macedonia and Achaia, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. So, after sending two who were assisting him, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Verse 23. Around that time... There arose no small uproar concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, a maker of silver shrines for Artemis, Diana, was providing no small amount of business to the craftsmen. He gathered these together along with those who related occupations and he said to the men you know that our wealth is from this business you see and hear that not only in Ephesus but also throughout all Asia Paul has persuaded and perverted a considerable crowd saying that handmade gods are not gods at all so they were idol makers and now Paul's communicar here is really messing with their business Verse 27, not only is there a danger that this trade of ours might come to some disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis, Diana, might be considered as nothing. And of course, that's Paul's point. He's trying to contrast the great assembly of Yahusha, the great nourisher of the assembly, Yahusha, and people are getting it and they're seeing that Diana and this great wonder of the world is nothing. This is huge. He is literally changing the world by the way he's communicating about the faith. And I don't want us to miss this, because I hope that we can do the very same thing. We can literally change the world by the way we communicate the true faith. Because you do realize, these millenniums out there, millennials, they haven't even, they don't even know what a B-I-B-L-E is. And you think I'm joking. They haven't even heard 
of Jesus Christ. It's not taught in their schools. It's not spoken in their peer group. It's certainly not communicated in their house. So where on earth would they get it? It's not communicated in the media. It's not in the newspapers. It's not in magazines. So where on earth would they hear it? And if they do hear it, it's going to be a perverted message that is void of power and truth and liberation. Because Yahusha liberates man. He liberates woman. He is a libertarian in the true manner. When people are literally shackled in sin and debauchery or oppressed by their very educational systems that have enslaved them. And when you give the true message of liberation, that changes lives. But sometimes you've got to tear down so you can build up. And Paul is very craftily tearing down the temple of Diana. And look what's happening. Now we can see now Acts chapter 19 verse 27. Not only is there a danger that this trade of ours might come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana might be considered as nothing. She whom all Asia and the world worships might even be thrown down from her majesty. You're starting to see right now Hollywood. That great goddess that we have, just like Diana, and to us, one of our great wonders of the modern world, people are starting to question. And if you start to expose all that immorality, and then you c connect, you understand that a lot of these Hollywood types that are caught up in the sexual immorality, in the abuse of women, in the abuse of children, they have funded the Democratic Party. You follow the money and you're going to find that it could crumble and the whole thing could come falling down. This is what Paul's dealing with. And all it takes is enough people having the courage to speak biblical truth and righteousness in a sick and perverted world. So don't think that this is something that just happened 2,000 years ago because Paul's Diana is our Hollywood. Their silversmiths is our Academy Awards. So don't think it doesn't matter because it does. And we are the voice of holiness in a sick and twisted world. And you can see the great threats that can come upon a perverted society that is caught up in all kinds of sexual immorality and abuse. Because that is idolatry. Idolatry and sexual immorality are linked. That is idolatry. What's going on in Hollywood? And with it becomes abuse and sexual immorality. Because that's always what encompasses idolatry. Does that make sense? So continue on. Verse 28, when they heard that they were filled with fury and began shouting, Great is Artemis, Diana of Ephesians. The city was filled with confusion. They rushed into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians... Macedonians who were travel companions of Paul. Paul was wanting to enter among the crowd, but the disciples would not let him go. So the chiefs of Asia, being his friends, sent to him and begged him not to surrender himself to the theater. This was entertainment. This was entertainment right here. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Most did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd, verse 33, solicited Alexander, whom the Jewish people put forward. Alexander motioned with his hand. He wished to offer a defense to the crowd. But recognizing that he was Jewish, for about two hours they all with one voice cried out, Great is Diana, Artemis of Ephesia. 
After the town clerk quieted the people, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there among you who doesn't know that the city of Ephesians is temple keeper to the great Artemis or Diana, and of her image fallen from heaven? Since these things were undeniable, you must be calm and do nothing reckless. So they've got out the administrators of the city are coming to the defense of this absolute perversion, which is including sexual immorality, abuse of women and children. Do you see that today? Do you see that politicians, the ones who've got the keys to the cities, are coming out in the defense of this? It's the same thing. It's always been the same thing. And it's about to be exposed just as it was then. Because more people are vocalizing truth and righteousness. We protect our wives. We protect our children. And we protect the family unit. And we are not going to put up with this any longer. And this is the thrust behind Ephesians. And if this doesn't inspire you to take action and speak out, then I don't know. And you have the voice. Because this is what the world is talking about now. But now you can interject the Bible and scripture and power into a conversation at the coffee shop. That's powerful. That's powerful. You can relate the book, you can open the book of Ephesians and you can talk about Hollywood and Harvey Weinstein. And I guess what? People are going to pay attention when you can start to connect the dots because there is nothing new under the sun. Sin is sin is sin and it leads unto death. Idolatry is always connected to the abuse of women and the abuse of children in the sexual realm. Always. It's called the worship of Molech. Right? wrong. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of being in such a perverted world. Verse 37, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor revilers of our goddess. If Detrimus and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them accuse them. But if you seek anything further, it will be settled in the lawful assembly. And that's what we need to do. We're having men raised up and saying, what is the lawful, the legal, the biblical way of dealing things? Because the whole system is corrupt, just as it was in Ephesus. But if you seek any fur- anything further, it will be settled in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today. There being no reason which we are able to give to justify this mob. Upon saying this, he dismissed the assembly. I mean, they had a population of close to 300,000 people. And there was a riot going on. This is the history and context of what we're about to jump into. And it is powerful. It is powerful. Because after Jerusalem and Antioch, Ephesus was the third most important city to the early believers. In fact, later, the apostle John escaped there and he was later buried there. Ephesus is where he composed his Gospels and the three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So it's very important. In fact, the zealots, the zealot disciples of John the Baptist, they'd legged it there too. They were living there. So it was becoming a zealot refuge, a zealot stronghold, because they'd legged it. They'd fled from Jerusalem, and now they were found within Ephesus. Turn with me to Acts chapter 19, verse 1. So while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul traveled through the upper region, and he came to Ephesus. He found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Ruach HaKodesh when you believed? They replied to him, No, we've never even heard that there is a Ruach HaKodesh. And today, there are so many righteous saints that have been caught up in the Hebrew roots and Messianic movement, and they are not experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. Because it's all Torah, 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 but it is spirit and truth. I've never heard of the Holy Spirit and seen its power.
power manifest in a Torah observant way. I'm not talking Pentecostal where it's all lawless and anything happens and you end up barking like dogs and slithering like snakes on the floor. I'm talking righteous manifestation. Remember Paul's moved from arguments to doxology and prayer because that's the manifestation of the Spirit. And they said in verse 3, no, we've never heard that there is such a thing as the Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you immersed? And they said, into Yochanan, into John's immersion. Paul said, John immersed with an immersion of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one coming after him, that is, Yahushua. And when they heard this, they were immersed into the name of the master, Yahushua. And when Paul laid hands upon them, the Ruach HaKodesh came upon them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Acts chapter 19. You've got to get the Spirit. You've got to get the Holy Spirit. So this is powerful. I'm excited to be able to get into this and be able to communicate prayerfully this powerful book in a time when we need it as believers. As things are happening in the world, we are in like an Ephesus. We truly are. This is an Ephesus situation, and it could go one way or the other. But you're seeing it in the news, and we're seeing it in the assemblies, the manifestation of power as we move from arguments and reason into doxology and prayer and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Because throughout this book, the theme is about discipleship and holy living discipleship and holy living it's about reliance upon that inner strength reliance upon a unity a unity of believers a knowledge that we are saved through the redemptive work of Yahushua and then that brings forth fruits of repentance and fruits of obedience and that knowledge brings us into that right standing and identity with Yahushua as the one that has reconciled us through his work and brought us into this great thing called the book of the covenant the covenants of promise this has all been inaugurated through Yahushua and Paul's going to communicate this to his audience this is a call to consistent and holy living how do you speak to one another how do you conduct yourself sexually how do you conduct yourselves in your domestic relationships we all need to bear growth and spiritual fruit together isn't that true and this is what he's communicating now we get into of course the ecclesia the assembly and the assembly we know has its origins in the covenants given to Abraham. The first mention of the word church in the Bible is in fact Genesis chapter 28 verse 4. That paradigm shift blows your mind. The church was born, ecclesia, the, the Hebrew word kahal, the Greek word ecclesia, first appears in the promise given to Abraham. You will be a church in the nations. Genesis 28 verse 4 when you understand that the church was born with the promise of the covenants of promise in Genesis 28 4 that changes your whole understanding of scripture we are that household of Elohim later identified as the Israel of Elohim this is a gospel message of unity delivered never severing the message from its historical and covenantal roots why is it being divorced from its historical and covenantal roots it does a disservice to all of us so when I look at this I mean this is like man Ephesians in two words it's uh, you know use a Greek phrase it's a Maximus Israel boom I mean that's what it is it is Israel to the nations Maximus Israel that'd be a great name for a son hey Maximus Israel wouldn't it man it'd be a gladiator or something this is my son Maximus Israel you mess with him double leg takedown hey I'm, maybe I'm gonna get Moshe that's gonna be Moshe's wrestling name yes yeah, Maximus Israel yeah we're gonna start that next week I think 
Maximus Israel. I mean, that's it. Israel expanded to the nation. This is the ecclesia, the assembly, the right standing way to live. We are empowered. We are empowered to live and demonstrate Israel's full potentials to the nations. Israel's full potential before the golden calf breach was powerful. And now we take up that. That is Maximus Israel. But you've got to smash down those idols of sexual immorality, abuse of women, abuse of children. And that was what was going on with the worship of Artemis and Diana. And that is what is going on in our theaters and in our world today. We've exchanged silversmiths for Golden Academy Awards. We've exchanged Diana for Harvey Weinstein. We've exchanged those that are funding it for the Democratic Party that is funding and being funded by this whole temple system. And I'm telling you, it's starting to crack. The veneer is starting to crack. But you've got to press through and be that voice in your community. Because Ephesians is powerful. It removes the impediments of the book of the law that was erected, that kept Israel cut off and in the nations. And now the nations, they were cut off from Israel. But that impediment, that book of the law has been removed. And now it's a return to the covenants of promise. And we can see now that that dividing wall, chapter 2, verse 14, that book of the law being the dividing, law, dividing wall, that Yahushua has now dismantled that dividing wall, that book of the law. And in his role as the Malkit Zedek, as the high priest, he is going to smash down all of that worship of Diana. He is going to build up one new man, and he's going to restore Maximus Israel. It's powerful. So, I think that's good. That's a good introduction, I hope. Prayerfully, Abba, we just bless you and praise you and ask that you would truly quicken and awaken us as we get into Ephesians chapter 1 next week. But we want to understand what's going on in the world today as Paul understood what was going on in Ephesus so that we can be rightly armed in preparation for the good work because we go out Abba, in the full armor. Just as Paul spoke in the sixth chapter, we're going to go out dressed in that armor because this is a battle. If you're not engaged in the battle, then you're asleep at the wheel. It's a battle, it's a war, and we have got to get in the Word, and we have got to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to go out into our communities. Amen? Amen. Amen. Questions, comments? Just a correction. Genesis 28, verse 3 is the birth of the church, the ecclesia, the kahal. Thank you. In Ephesus, yes. But remember, this was a circular. This is a circular, I believe, a circular that went around to all of the communities in Asia Minor. So anything else in the back, Brother Steve? No. Oh, well, blessings and um, stick around. And what an um, amazing season ahead, I truly believe. Praise Yah. Praise Yah. Amen.